31.46 and 2,350. Those are two important numbers that are the topic of today's Bold and Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. And today, money, 31.46. Does that ring a bell to you? That is the national debt, if you add the word trillion after it. And that's the debt for this particular second in time. And now it's gone up and now it's gone up and now it's gone up at infinity, at infinity to infinity, I should say. 31.467 trillion is America's national debt. And what is the 2,350 number? Those are approximately the number of Bible verses that talk about money and debt and finances. Jesus had quite a bit to say about this all very important topic. And before I get into all that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app. That is your online platform for faith-based podcasts at washingtontimes.com. And guess what? Now there are two places. That's right, two. Another important number to remember. Two places at WashingtonTimes.com where you may subscribe to Bold and Blunt or listen to it. You can go to the newsletter section, click on it, find Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. That's right, that's me. Click on that and sign up for my Bold and Blunt newsletter. It comes out three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It contains my commentaries along with my Tuesday and Thursday Bold and Blunt podcast. Or, or, and this is number two, you can go to the Washington Times newest product, Higher Ground newsletter. It's a newsletter dedicated entirely to faith-based topics. It includes all kinds of contributors, but included in that newsletter, which you can also find at WashingtonTimes.com under the newsletter section, again, called Higher Ground. Click on it, put in your email address, and you will get it right to your email box. Included in that newsletter are my twice a week Bold and Blunt podcast, as well as other podcasts that you just simply have to check out. You may also get Bold and Blunt, guess what, wherever podcasts are offered. Understanding the national debt, fiscal data, a, a, a website production of the Treasury Department writes, the national debt, $31.47 trillion, I guess they're just rounding up that six. Why not? Because by the time I'm done speaking, it probably will be technically a seven. $31.47 trillion, the national debt, is the total amount of outstanding borrowing by the U.S. federal government accumulated over the nation's history. That is abysmal. $31.47 trillion. How are we going to pay that off? Well, if you're in politics, if you're in government, chances are you're thinking, eh, not my problem. I'll just boot it down the road for the next politician to deal with. After all, I'm not an expert. I'm not a monetary expert. Well, you know what? Guess what? Neither am I. But when I look at my own household finances, I know that if I borrow more than I'm able to pay back in a set, determined, comfortable period of time, that I'm living outside my means. And that's something that's bad. Let's just say that's bad. Living inside your means, good. Living outside your means, bad. And if I ever were to live outside my means, I would not feel like getting up and going to work in the morning because I know everything that I did that day, all the work, all the effort, all the hours I put in, put in would be resulting in a paycheck that, boom, goes right to pay off debt. So what's the point? It's like you're living in slavery. Well, isn't that interesting? Debt, in fact, is a type of slavery. The top 10 reasons why the national debt 
matters. That is a posting from the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. I honestly have never heard of that before, but it is at pgpf.org. And it was posted just May 12th, 2023. So we're talking about some current numbers here. This post talks about at 31 trillion and rising, the national debt threatens America's economic future. Here are the top 10 reasons why the national debt matters. Peter G. Peterson Foundation writes, the first one, trillion dollar deficits are now the norm. Isn't that interesting? It was in my lifetime where such a phenomenal amount of national debt would have been unheard of unspeakable even. And yet here we are, 31 trillion gazillion, the numbers don't even mean anything anymore. The Congressional Budget Office, Peter G. Peterson writes, projects that the U.S. government will run trillion dollar deficits over the next 10 years, resulting in a cumulative deficit of, get this, Da 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 da, drum roll please, 20.3 trillion between 2024 and 2033. So, just in a few short years, this 31 trillion is going to be even higher, right? We're going to be running trillion dollar deficits over the next 10 years. Wow. Number two interest costs are growing rapidly. The website writes, interest costs were $476 billion in 2022 and are projected to rise to $1.4 trillion by 2033. Wow, interest alone will kill you, right? In 2023 alone, we will spend more on net interest costs than we do on Medicaid and income security programs. Wow, look at the government. Look at what the government will do now. They will talk about cutting Medicaid, talk about cutting Medicare, talk about cutting Social Security, right? Problem is, Social Security, for instance, is not exactly your typical entitlement program. Just look at your own paycheck. If you are an American out there listening in bold and blunt land who actually works, which I'm sure you are, because otherwise you wouldn't have an interest in this podcast. But look at your paycheck, right? See how much goes to Social Security. That's not exactly entitlement. That's called my money, my money that the government is taking and misappropriating, even though it's supposed to be in a lockbox, a lockbox that says do not touch even though the whole program itself was supposed to be a do not touch program initially. But then when Congress and, and, and Capitol Hill kept dipping into it, then they came forward with, the, with this idea, let's put it in a lockbox and make it really, really do not touch. Well, how's that working out? I can tell you, if you see all that hundreds and thousands of dollars being taken out of your paycheck, mandated, forced, out of your hands and put under the government social security program to one day return to you upon your retirement. If you're waiting on that, mm, I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't hold your breath. That's going to disappear like a puff of smoke in the air. Key investments in our future are at a risk is the number one, three reason why why the national debt matters. Higher interest costs could crowd out important public investments that can fuel economic growth. Priority areas like education, R&D, research and development, and infrastructure, which if you're Joe Biden, infrastructure means everything, right? Anything and everything. It's not bridges and roads and and roads and bridges, but it's people. It's, it's, It's people people helping people, and it's climate change, and and so forth. A nation saddled with debt, Peter G. Peterson writes, will have less to invest in its own future. And that, I think, is a strategic maneuver of the left when it comes to caring little about debt. Number three on this list, as, as well as number four, which I'm about to read, is probably 
a motivation of the left to drive debt even higher. Number four reads, rising debt means fewer economic opportunities for Americans. Rising debt reduces business investment and slows economic growth. It also increases expectations of higher rates of inflation and erosion of confidence in the U.S. dollar. The federal government should not allow budget imbalances to harm our economy and families across the country. And if you're a leftist, you read that as the federal government should allow budget imbalances to harm our economy and families across the country. Because, of course, that is your whole reason for being if you are in the Democrat Party. You want to make government the god of the people. And as part of that end game, you need to make the people reliant on government for all material provisions. And how best to accomplish that than by having debt spiral out of control. So the country is in a financial chaotic situation, desperate, turning to government for provision. You don't want, if you're a leftist, if you're a Democrat, you don't want Americans happily providing for themselves and their family. You don't want a thriving, chugging along, entrepreneurial middle class with little to no need of government entitlements, of government dole outs, of government stimulus, Joe Biden. You don't want that. You want all those people, despondent, depressed, staying at home, waiting for the checks to come from the government when the government decides it's time to send out the checks. So if you look at number three and number four again, key investments in our future are at risk by massive bloated debt and rising debt means fewer economic opportunities for Americans. Those are two key end games of the left because it all feeds into their ability to control the masses, right? Slow the growth, make the nation's workers, employees, business class work solely to pay the debts of the state and then wait in anticipation and hunger and probably darkness, thank you climate change activists, for the government to dole out the little piddly checks to get us through the next months, next month's rent and food bills and ever escalating utility costs, which of course will only be for those lucky select few who actually can afford any utilities at all in their home. Climate change activists, when they have their way, will all be outside cooking our food, what food we're allowed to have from the government, over some open campfires that we're able to scrounge up and put together using sticks, sticks collected in nearby woods and forests. The new gold will be firewood. So debt, 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 debt. It's a device of the Democrats. It's a device of the devil because it enslaves. And guess what? We're taught this in the Bible. We're taught this by Jesus himself in the Bible. EnvoyFinancial.com writes this. What does the Bible say about money and stewardship? Did you know that there are roughly 2,350 verses concerning money in the Bible? That's almost twice as many as verses about faith and prayer combined. Jesus had a lot to say about money. Isn't that interesting? You think it's all about faith and and praying to God and so forth. Well, the Bible speaks massively about how we should be good stewards of our money. And even though the Bible is speaking most of the time on an individual basis about good stewardship of money and finances and material resources, what is a government? What is a nation? but made up of individuals. So the principles that are put in place for the individuals still hold true 
when you're talking about it on a larger scale, when you're talking about these same principles, money management, for example, on a larger scale. Nearly 15% of everything Jesus spoke about related to money and possessions, Envoy Financial reported. 16 out of 38 parables, you know, the parables of Jesus, dealt with the topic of money. The only subject Jesus taught more about money was the kingdom of God. Here are some of the teachings. Proverbs 21, 20. A wise man saves for the future, but a foolish man spends whatever he gets. Now let's just sub, sub in a couple words and sub out a couple words. A wise nation saves for its future, but a foolish nation spends whatever it collects from the taxpayers. Isn't that interesting, right? So where does America stand on that? It's kind of obvious, right? 31 point la di da trillion in debt, national debt. A wise man saves for the future, Proverbs 21. Money little by little grows. I wish you could say the same for the debt, I, for debt. I wish you could say the same for debt little by little grows, but that's just not so, is it? The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, Proverbs 10:22. Of course, the uh, prosperity preachers out there seem to focus on this one. They, they seem to suggest that if you're loved by God, then eventually God will give you great material possessions and lots of money and you'll be rich, rich, rich. And that's a sign of God's love. And they point to passages like this, uh, as well as stories about Solomon, for example, richest man ever, blessed by God. Uh, given his riches, because when God gave him a choice to ask for one thing, he did not say riches. He asked for wisdom. And in addition to giving him wisdom, Solomon, of course, was the wisest in history, right? The wisest guy in history. In addition to granting him that wisdom, he granted him great wealth and so forth. And too bad Solomon, if you read the Bible, the story of his downfall, too bad he didn't use that wisdom wisely, right? Anyhow, that's a different topic, different day. But just to wrap up and apply that principle, that need for wisdom to today's America, to modern America, again, let's go back to that first number. 31.47 trillion. That's our debt. Come on. Republicans are really just as guilty as Democrats on this. Nobody on Capitol Hill wants to talk up the need to reel in and, and bring down the national debt. But what we're doing in essence is enslaving our next generation. We're coming to a halt on our ability as a nation to grow, which will mean that we're coming to a halt on our ability as a nation to prosper. And again, you have to realize this is a decided design of the far left, the Democrats in cohorts with their partners at the globalist government levels. And I have a guest today who really is expert at talking about these matters. Uh, and, and, and really delving into the layman's explanation of why debt matters, why America's state of financial bleakness is even bleaker than you might imagine. His name is Dave Bratt. He works out of Liberty University. He was formerly a dean of the Liberty University School of Business. And of course, you remember his name from Congress when he served in the Republican Party after unseating the then House Majority Leader Eric Cantor during a time of conservative uprising in this country called the Tea Party activism. Dave, thank you so much for being back on Bold and Blonde. It's always great to have you here. 
Great to be on, Cheryl. Love all your work and research. Thank you so much. And I love how you fight for American freedoms as well, uh, particularly your fight a few years ago on behalf of Tea Party ideals, which makes me makes me think you're the perfect guest right now as debt ceiling fights go forward on Capitol Hill and Republicans seem to cave to Democrats far too often on raising the debt ceiling. What is the state of America's debt, and how worried should we be? Yeah, it's. Uh, I ran, uh, you know, for Congress and won a big race, uh, you know, years ago, and I ran on all the economic issues back then, and no one cared. I was fairly shocked, and it, it in, in a nutshell, it's roughly because the kids don't have anybody representing them up in D.C. Uh, but the real cause. Of, of our economic decline it's been about four decades in the making the world's expert economist on productivity is at northwestern university robert gordon and if you look at his work productivity back under you know reagan in the early 80s etc was at four five six percent and so was gdp growth so back then if you had debt problems you could grow your way out of it but unfortunately now the biggest deal is that productivity has gone straight down since that period of time on a graph, straight down 40 years in a row, and now it's at 1%, and so, uh, and declining, and there's no, you know, there's no good signs uh, on the horizon, and so that, that means uh, we're going to have the real economy will be growing at about 1% as well. And so the part that's confusing right now for the American people is that the stock market still goes up. Right. Uh, and, and that's because the Fed, the Federal Reserve, set interest rates at zero percent. And so they were trying to create this wealth effect, you know, wealth, the stock market wealth that would eventually trickle down to the real economy. That never happened. Uh, about 10 percent of the wealthy own about 80 percent of the stocks and wealth. And the middle class and the poor have gotten zero. And so wages have been flat for 40 years, whereas the wealthy have gone up. And uh, we're now facing $50 trillion in debt uh, in the 10-year budget window. And that's CBO, Congressional Budget Office, right? So that's not, you know, conservative ideology. That's the fact. And so we just had a chance to correct that somewhat. And the, uh, the you know, these extremists, uh, Tea Party, uh, you know, conservative uh, Republicans had the gall to try to save four trillion off of fifty trillion in debt, and that was called extreme by everyone. Oh. And so the average American is going to have to make up their mind on that: Are they extreme, or are they just trying to do a little bit of savings for the American people? And that's clearly my view. Dave, where does this lead? It, this is not sustainable, yeah. obviously, but yeah. how fast does it lead us to wherever you're about to tell me where it leads? Yeah, well, it's very hard to say because I've been wrong for a couple of years. You know, the no one could have ever guessed our Federal Reserve would stimulate the economy by $9 trillion on their balance sheet, right? $9 trillion. You can go look it up right now. God, We're trying hey. to trim it back right now a little bit to, you know, to rein in inflation. And then on top of that, you know, the, the budgets back when I was in were four trillion, and then it went to you know five trillion in uh, nineteen, and now uh, under COVID we had seven trillion dollar government spending. That's not the Federal Reserve. So on top of nine trillion in stimulus, you had seven trillion, and then seven trillion, and then this year about six and a half trillion in government spending, juicing it, and this debt ceiling increase they just juiced it by another four trillion, and so you know. We're going into debt. The interest rates are going up. It's clearly not sustainable. And uh, when does it end? I, I do not know because we're way past my point of no return. The one thing I can tell you is, in ten years, when the debt's fifty trillion, oh, wow. uh, that if you do five percent interest rate on that, which is what it is right now, right? So the federal funds rate. If you do 5% of $50 trillion, that's $2.5 trillion in just interest payment, okay. right? And so, like I just said, the, the whole budget used to be 4 or $5 trillion. In 10 years, guaranteed, you got interest on the debt at $2.5 trillion. Uh, that's three times the current defense budget. Wow. And so it's not sustainable. And what we're talking about here is just 25% 
of the budget. Three-fourths of it is uh, mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, and all that, and they're all insolvent uh, in the next you know, 10, 15 years by their own board of trustees statement. So yeah, I wish I had some good news. It's up to the American people to have a massive turnaround. Uh, and, and even if we decided right now to do all the right things, it would still be an incredibly huge hole that they got up. Let, let's let's look at it a little bit in terms of moral values, because what you describe, the only way we're continued to go forward in America as an economic power is because everything to do with the financial sector is fake, right? Yeah. There's no gold standard, so it's been fake for some some time now, but it, it's really into this fantasy land of imaginary money. Yep. Yeah. No, that's right. It, it, it's a fiat currency, and, you know, uh, uh, so that, that's awful. We, we should be pegged to gold, or if you want to get fancy about it, you can follow a guy out at Stanford called Taylor with a Taylor rule. And if you would have followed that, we wouldn't have had the 08 financial crisis, and we wouldn't be in this everything bubble. And so, yeah, the, 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 the money is fake, uh, but you're right, the, the, the spiritual piece is the real piece, right? The, the thing that made this country great was across the board, the religious traditions, but there's this thing called you know, the Protestant work ethic. Yes. Which stood for reinvesting, right? And then, and, and then, no matter what religion you were, you know, the grandparent generation would do anything for their grand, for their kids or their grandkids. They'd sacrifice greatly and forego, you know, a, a conspicuous consumption and luxury goods and all this crazy stuff you got on every corner now uh, for the sake of the future of their kids. That is not happening right now. And then the kids have been afforded every opportunity. Uh, but, you know, the Chinese and the Indians are eating our lunch on human capital, right? Computer science, engineering, and mathematics. And our kids are doing, you know, social science, liberal, crazy studies thing uh, instead of anything that's productive. And so, it, yeah, that that's the, the, the spiritual piece. Who knows? You know, that <clears throat> between people and their maker. Uh, but collectively, the Wall Street Journal just about a month ago, you know, had a piece with uh, religion and uh, patriotism both dropping – uh, from from 70 or 68 percent or so favorable down to 38 percent favorable for yeah. for patriotism and for religiosity and that's in the last five years and so the left has been very effective right the marxist uh marx you know carl of the original marx uh was an atheist and uh thought religion was a superstructure created by the rich to keep the poor down uh the, the loss of religion and patriotism is going to create poor like you've never seen in this country right now. If we keep on this this this, this pattern of destruction, right? The, the U.S. has always been optimistic and constructive. We constructed free markets and we constructed the rule of law. And we, we constructed a, a, a network of faith following revealed religions. Uh, but now it's destructive. The Marxists, the leftists, they just hate the country. They hate God. Uh, in Freudian terms, they got their fist up in the air. They're kicked off at their father. And uh, they're just all angry. And uh, it just shows every day on the news. Which, which leads me to my next question. What you say about America is headed toward a time of poverty like never before seen. Now, who benefits from this, right? We all know the globalists benefit if America falls, but who, who specifically do you see benefiting from America's economy just falling on its face? Yeah, well, there's, there's three big answers, and they're not all coordinated, which, which makes it complex, right? So mm-hmm. right off the bat, we just said, you know, the, the wealth effect, the, the wealthy in this country have wealth like you cannot imagine, right? Our big five tech firms, the market cap of our big five technology firms in the U.S. is worth more than all European firms combined. Wow. Our big firms are also worth the market cap of all Chinese firms combined. So there's your wealth. That's who's benefiting. Uh, it, while they help build the surveillance state of the Chinese uh, CCP, the Communist Party, uh, to repress and create a slave class in China using their big tech instrument, it's it's morally an outrage. So that's number one is the, you know the, the the owners of stock and wealth have benefited greatly, and then you've got the globalist elite, right? Uh, Soros and all the 
Euro elites uh, in, you know, the United Nations system, WHO, and all that kind of thing. And uh, the, then the third big one is the Chinese Communist Party, right, who has communist aims. And Xi Jinping, about a month ago, gave the, the uh, 20th Party speech and said, we're going full-on Marxist-Leninist. Uh, we're getting rid of... Uh, we're getting rid of uh, any economic reforms, which means market innovations, and we're uh, we're getting rid of all Chinese culture, language, harmony, peace, and we're turning it into a war footing language instead. So uh, those are the three big buckets that are coming after the U.S. and they've been highly effective. Well, it it's hard to it, it's hard to be an American entrepreneur and and see any hope on the future, any show of optimism where you can actually do business and be left alone by the government. Yeah, no, that, that's right, and and th- there still is hope. That that is where my hope is, right? The uh, the American uh, businessman and woman uh, are the hope. They're creative. They're entrepreneurial. They got work ethic still like crazy. Uh, they want to do the right thing. They still believe in the country, and you can still get it done, even in the midst of this. But boy, you've got to put your heart and soul and everything you own up at risk to pull it off. But uh, and it, it, it's incredibly harder than it's ever been. But there is success all over the country, and those those are the folks who are going to have to band together and organize, and they're too busy working to organize. That's, uh, on the conservative side, that's our problem, right? We don't have endless nonprofits. I think the left out, uh, outnumbers us on the nonprofit front. I think it's you know ten to twenty to one, and the dollar figures are the same. And so it's very hard to fight against that when they're so coordinated. But the advantage we have is we believe in something greater than ourselves, and they do not. And so that that is also a hope. So I, I want to go back to what you said early on, that productivity over 40 years has declined from 4, 5, 6% is normal to now 1%, and it's still uh, declining from that 1%. Is the solution for America's economic woes and, and debt crises to bring back productivity? That seems common sense, but really the follow-up question is, how do we do that? What led to the decline in productivity in the first place? Yeah, well, you just contrast us. The, you know, the, the Chinese have been hugely productive, but the, you know, they've been cheating. They've been stealing intellectual property, uh, and they got a 40% savings rate. And if you're a communist, you just take the 40% savings rate from the people and shove it toward uh, government uh, innovation, technology, defense projects, which are, are productive. And so in the U.S., our government sector takes the money and invests in pronoun studies. Oh, I'm exaggerating a bit, but not much. Yep. And then on the business front, uh, the the key to macro growth and productivity over the long run has been capital investment. Uh, and again, the, the government sector now at seven trillion is crowding out private investment. Right when the when the when the, when the treasuries have to be bought and sold and the government needs its debt to be financed by the Fed, all of that is competing against private sector capital markets. And so you, you've got kind of the Chinese picture, you've got the capital picture, the technological growth. Uh, as Gordon says, well, well look, I see, I see technology everywhere. I see, you know, every kid's got a cell phone and Robert Gordon's response is, yes, I, I know I see technology everywhere except in the data. And so it, it, it hasn't enhanced the American worker's ability to make more stuff per hour. And that's what productivity is, making more stuff per hour. And then the final bucket that leads to productivity growth is human capital, uh, which is roughly knowledge. And I, I just reviewed that. Look at the state of our K-12 you know, K education system. The, uh, the scores are down. Domestically, they're down in, in relative terms against international competitions. Uh, and I, I think just everybody knows in the inner cities, uh, if the left supposedly loves our kids and they're destroying them. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, complex argument they got to make for how they love the kids so much. <laughs> just two more questions, Dave, if you have time. Yes? Sure. Oh, yeah. 
So if you're looking at the landscape of presidential candidates in the Republican uh, Party right now, because Democrats, of course, we, we, we won't even discuss them about solving this crisis. But who, who is best in the Republican Party that you see right now who can tackle this problem uh, and, and really stand strong against the forces of fighting that will come? Yeah, well, I'm I'm at a university slot right now at a 501c3, so I stayed no. in economics and business <laughs> and less on the politics. But the, the, you know, you just got to compare the top few candidates uh, who who have forged their way on these issues, and so you know, people are going to have to explore the backgrounds and the and the backdrop and whatever, and. Uh, <laughs> The, you know, Trump has the advantage that he actually has won and showed the path through the Midwest uh, that no former Republican has ever done. Uh, DeSantis is, is getting props, you know, uh, in, in for his, his governorship, et cetera. But uh, everyone's just going to have to review the facts and see who can take on, who do you trust that's big enough to go head-to-head against Xi Jinping. That's my proxy because that's our greatest existential threat right now even more than uh, the economic case i just laid out the, the china threat they're weakening they're, they're cracking at the seams kind of just like uh, japan did and they have demographic problems and innovation problems and you know you can only build so many ghost cities and so many bullet trains and then you got to get a little bit more clever and so you need someone that can stand toe-to-toe with the chinese the russians etc and so that that would be my first few uh my, my tips on uh, on who to vote for, whoever you think can solve those problems at, on the geopolitical level and then tackle these cultural problems and then the, uh, the economic growth problems. Excellent. OK, um, so so last question, then you overcame um, great odds to beat Eric Cantor in a position of Republican leadership. Uh, during a, a phase of American politics where the Tea Party was coming on strong. Do you see the groundwork being laid for another Tea Party type uprising? Because one of the key principles that brought us the Tea Party was bloated government spending. Yeah, no, absolutely. I do see uh, some optimism on that front because, and it's even better than the Tea Party. The Tea Party people who love the country, patriot, uh, people of great faith, the Judeo-Christian West, but now you tack on, you know, uh, black, brown, blue-collar workers uh, uh, through this populist front, which is new. And, you know, populism doesn't just have, you know, it's not some ideology that just springs up. It comes about historically when you have just gigantic uh, differences uh, in the class structure, right? I mean, it's kind of like Marx was kind of right, except you had all the wrong solutions. If you get the distribution of income to diverge, like we just said, right, where ten percent of the the wealthy own eighty to ninety percent of the wealth and the stocks, wow, uh, you've got a problem, right? And so the populist front is just a common sense front, uh, and then the question is, can they, can the Republicans and the conservatives, and all these views are just my own on the politics, can they overcome uh, the ideology of the left, which you know is just the standard Marxist critique of elites. Uh, but their solution is, you know, diversity on every front, uh, racist. They, they've become uh, the race hawks uh, and, the, and the gender hawks and the, and the uh, creative pronoun hawks and et cetera. And if you think that's really a solution against China, when China's the one that's spreading that to the U.S., Right, or if you think that's a solution to grow the economy, or if you think that's a solution to enhance the education of our kids in productivity, you know, if we can't win that, we can't. Yeah, you know, we don't got a prayer. But the problem is our leadership never makes that case. The Speaker of the House and the, the, the and McConnell in the Senate are never at the microphone making the simplest case. Like, are you in favor of fifty trillion in debt? <laughs> you never heard our side say that. So it's. It, that's very disheartening when the argument is ours to own. We have the moral high ground. We have every rational argument I can see under the sun. And the left just has, at this point, they're just shaking their fist in anger at the gods. Yeah, what? what? Actually, at the un-gods, right. What, yeah, why is that? Right. Why, why is it? You make a really good point. Why isn't the, the Republican leadership raising these very simple points? Why not? 
Yeah, well, the answer is when I was in conference, right, there's about you know, 220 Republicans sitting in a room. And there, uh, our leadership won't make the tough arguments because about 30 of those folks are in very tough cities, right? Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Boston, you, you know, just the, the, the Democrat hotspots. And they don't want any language that hurts those uh, members in their races. And they just leave you on your own. Right? And they'll give each of those members 20 to 30 million each. And then if you've ever voted against the budget or whatever, like I did, they give you zero. Oh, wow. And so no one knows this kind of stuff, but it's, it's become clear in this, uh, this late, latest uh, debt ceiling increase, the penalties that are attached to the folks who wouldn't go along uh, with, the, with the formulas that made no sense at all. So it's uh, our leadership. It, it, it's just that's why we're losing the country. If you don't take a stand against these major structural issues we've been talking about, that then we will lose our country. Yep, it, it's politics over uh, principle yep. once again. Yep. Well, uh, right. Dave Brad, I, I want to thank you so much for the stand you take for America and for coming back on Bold and Blunt. You've given much to think about, and it's always great to have you as a guest. Thank you. Honored to be on show. Keep up your great work, and God bless you. God bless. Whenever I think of Liberty University, where Dave Brad again, works. I think of how Liberty University came under fire from the far left because of its refusal early on in the coronavirus crazy, early on to shut down and send students home and force them into shots and face masks and all that. And and I think, hey, there are some good guys still out there in the university system. I want to thank you for listening. I want to remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, the online platform for faith-based podcasts, at washingtontimes.com, either by subscribing directly to my newsletter, Cheryl Chumley, which contains my commentaries as well as my Bold and Blunt podcast, or by subscribing to Higher Ground, the new faith-based newsletter put out by the Washington Times, which includes Bold and Blunt, along with a couple of other things. Actually, a few other great things. You need to check out that new Higher Ground newsletter. But one more quick mention, you may also get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. If you are already a subscriber, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And so doesn't the executives at the Washington Times truly humbled by your support. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, stay blunt, stay bold.